and my watch now says 2 p.m. So I think we can go ahead and jump in and get started. Um, welcome everyone. My name is Sarah Swalkup. I'm a program coordinator with Virginia Clean City. Um, and thank you all for joining us today for the Drive Clean Rural Virginia webinar series. Um, I want to start off by thanking the Virginia Clean Cities team, um, specifically John Mayorana, who has been helping me set up and coordinate this event and helping us reach out to all of the great rural counties and fleets we have here in Virginia. Um, as we go through, um, I would just like to let everyone know, please try to mute yourself if you're not currently speaking. Uh, just to make everyone's uh, viewing experience more enjoyable. So to begin, I would like to introduce everyone to the project that has allowed us to bring our great speakers and fleets together today. The Drive Clean Rural USA project is funded by the Department of Energy and led by the Transportation Energy Partners, a national nonprofit organization that brings clean city coalition leaders together with the clean transportation energy industry to advance policies that will reduce American dependence on petroleum-based fuels. Eight clean city coalition, including ours, are working with TEP to provide on the ground assistance to 24 selected counties and to companies and institutions within those counties. Our coalitions are in the business of helping government and private fleets transition to clean fuels. For those of you who are unfamiliar with Virginia Clean Cities, we are a nonprofit organization headquartered in Harrisonburg, Virginia, and servicing the entirety of the Commonwealth. Over the past 25 years, our mission has been to advance air quality improvement, economic opportunity, and energy security through the deployment of alternative fuel vehicles and infrastructure, education programs, and other petroleum reduction activities. During this time, we have worked with a number of municipalities and fleets across the Commonwealth to help identify how transitioning to alternative fuels can best serve their needs, and today we hope to extend those same services to you. Now, in addition to Clean Cities Coalitions, we also have an amazing group of industry partners who will provide demonstration vehicles, training and technical expertise on the full range of clean fuels of this project. One important thing to emphasize is that we are fuel neutral. We believe that any transition away from petroleum based fuels is a positive step and we will work with you to find the right solutions based on your needs. Now, the goal of this project is to help small and rural communities benefit from clean fuels and vehicles. Alternative fuel and vehicle technologies have come a long way in the past 10 years and communities across the country are saving money and breathing cleaner air by transitioning away from gasoline and diesel vehicles in favor of clean domestic fuels. Barriers to access are leaving small and rural communities out and this program is looking to fix that. Our goal is to get more small and rural communities benefiting from clean fuels and vehicles. Through this project, we will be providing fleets and counties four areas of assistance. Fleet technical assistance, demonstration vehicles, regional job and business growth support, and the promotion of fleet leadership. The most significant asset partner fleets and counties will receive is in-depth technical assistance. We will work closely with your fleet managers to assess your current fleets in order to identify where it might make sense to start a transition to clean fuel vehicles. In addition to doing a fleet assessment for the county, we can also work with major institutions such as hospitals, school districts, and commercial fleets. Then we will work with you to develop a plan to transition to clean fuels and vehicles considering factors such as the short and long-term fleet priorities and best applications for clean fuels and vehicles identified during the assessment, costs and benefits of clean fuel types for various applications, fueling infrastructure and financing options, and federal and state financial incentives. Our goal is to help you create a five to 10 year plan that makes financial sense and can be realistically implemented. Our industry partners are also loaning vehicles for demonstration purposes. Some vehicles will be available for day-long drive and ride events, and we will help county fleets organize those events with your community. Others will be available for your staff to use for a week or longer. The vehicle providers also have technical expertise and will be able to share tips and training with your fleet operators and technicians. One of the unique opportunities that many rural communities have is the opportunity for business and job growth around the production of biofuels and renewable natural gas from local farms and landfills. We can help with outreach and technical assistance to encourage this in your communities. And last but certainly not least, a big three-year priority for the Drive Clean Rural USA project is to share lessons we've learned that can help other small and rural communities benefit from clean fuels. Participating counties and communities will be featured in the replication playbook, which will be disseminated nationally through the Department of Energies, Clean City Coalitions, and our industry partners and other organizations. All along the way, we wanna spotlight the great work and leadership that counties are doing with public, the publication of participation in press releases and other media outreach, 
We'll also invite you to participate in social media campaigns, and we are excited to have so many great partners, including some industry and nonprofit partners with very large audiences. Transportation Energy Partners is also seeking opportunities to spotlight counties such at events such as the National Association of Counties Conference and other national and state events. And now we will get into our speakers. Um, I will run through a short introduction here. So up first, we will hear from Michael Phillips. Michael retired from law enforcement after a 28 year career where he last served as a major of criminal enforcement division of a sheriff's office in North Carolina. After retiring from law enforcement, Mike became the municipal law enforcement specialist for Alliance Autogas in 2015. At Alliance Autogas, he serves law enforcement in municipal counties throughout the Southeast and Gulf states with clean energy autogas programs. After Mike, we'll hear from Jill Hamilton about ethanol and biodiesel. Jill is president of the Sustainable Energy Solutions Incorporated. She has more than 30 years of consulting experience in alternative transportation fuels industry. Over the past 23 year, years, Jill and her team have raised hundreds of millions of dollars for the biofuels industry. She also is a trusted advisor to the National Clean City Program. She is chair of the Greater Washington Regional Clean City Coalition, and for the past 20 years, she has provided ethanol market with development for the Mid-Atlantic region on behalf of the Maryland Grain Producers. She is also a key consultant to the National Biodiesel Board and its foundation. In addition to her biofuels background, she brings a deep familiarity of government grant writing, project management, and project fundraising. Prior to starting SESI, she co-managed the Information Resources Incorporated Alternative Fuels Division and ran the National Alternative Fuels Hotline for the Department of Energy. After Jill, we will hear from Sherry Merrow about natural gas. Sherry is the Natural Gas Vehicles for America and GD America State Government Affairs Director, leading a team of 175 people from more than 70 member companies located throughout the nation who focus on state advocacy for natural gas vehicle infrastructure and policy, regulatory requirements, and incentive programs to grow the natural gas vehicle industry, including renewable natural gas. In addition to her work for NGV America, Sherry has worked in the oil and gas industry as an advisor for natural gas vehicle program, builds a bachelor's degree in computer science and literature. And then last but not least, we will hear from Devin Slater about transportation electrification. Devin is an energy solutions specialist in electrification at Dominion Energy. She came to Dominion Energy in 2018 after four years in the fuel industry. She began her Dominion Energy career with a team that audited customer bills where she became familiar with tariffs customer types, and various complex billing processes. In 2019, she transitioned to the electrification team where her love for innovation met her background in transportation. She has worked on many specialized project teams that focus on decarbonization of transportation from airports to large truck fleets to the everyday EV driver. Devin graduated from the University of Mary Washington with a bachelor's degree in historic preservation. And in her free time, she enjoys reading and spending time with her husband in two labs. Now, after these great speakers speak, we will be holding a Q&A session at the end. So please hold your questions. Um, if you have questions that you wanna put in the chat, go ahead, we will take note of them and then you can bring them back in during that Q&A session. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to Mike. Thank you, Sarah. Um, again, as you stated, I'm not a salesperson or uh, anything like that. I'm an ex-cop. Uh, the way that I got into doing auto gas at all was the agency I was with actually did a project. We did a 60 vehicle conversion while I was there. Um, and it was through that that um, I realized what some of these alternative energy things could do for fleet vehicles. Uh, we, we had extremely good success with our program. And once I retired from law enforcement, um, it, it was just sort of a natural progression for me uh, to try to get into this. And Alliance Auto Gas has given me that, that opportunity. Um, who we are, which is the next slide, Sarah. Um, we are Alliance Auto Gas. We provide vehicle conversion and technology um, for the uh, propane auto gas uh, conversion. Um, we build the auto gas refueling infrastructure and we align with customers with other surrounding uh, vendors where they can purchase uh, fuel as well if they're having to go out of their jurisdiction. Uh, we seamlessly, seamlessly integrate your auto gas stations 
uh, with a uh, in-house fuel management system, or it can be tied into your existing fuel management system. Um, we provide all the training needed to the drivers as well um, as how to operate, maintain, and support, install the system. Okay, our systems, um, the next slide, all of our systems have undergone uh, rigorous testing and are EPA certified. Um, the way we do it now is proprietary. We use a plug and play system, uh, which requires no permanent modifications of the vehicle. Um, our systems come with a five year, 100,000 mile warranty. Um, and we offer several different tank solutions uh, that depending on the circumstance or the vehicle, that you may be converting, uh, which one may suit your needs best. Okay, the next one. Um, Alliance offers more than 450 EPA certified platforms, uh, including Ford, Chevrolet, Dodge, Ram. Um, and again, we have certificates range from sedan to large trucks, all the way up to, if it was a Ford, it could be an F-750. We do not convert diesel vehicles. Uh, but we like to say if it runs on gas, we convert it. If it's a weed eater, we can convert it. If it's a mower, we convert it. So I have several more accounts uh, throughout the country. Uh, that next slide. Uh, less is more. What you see with uh, auto gas propane uh, are reduced uh, greenhouse gases and emissions. Um, the slide there shows you. I'm not going to read it for you. Um, but we, we also are. Um, Delivering Thursday in the state of Virginia at Petersburg, uh, the city of Petersburg, we will be, be delivering the first load of renewable propane into the state of Virginia. Um, Petersburg just has in the middle of doing a large conversion uh, program, uh, and we're going to be delivering that propane, the renewable propane for them to operate on. Um, there's no carbon whatsoever in renewable propane, so it does uh, reduce emissions dramatically. Uh, next slide. Uh, the top benefits of auto gas, really, we call it the three E's. Um, it's economics, environment, and energy security. Basically, what you're going to see is if you convert a vehicle to auto gas propane, you're going to realize at least a dollar savings on each gallon that you pump. Uh, it can be more right now. It's actually a little more than a dollar, um, but typically it's somewhere around a dollar. Um, again, the environment where it reduces greenhouse gases, uh, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, nitrogen oxide. Uh, the energy security aspect of it is 100%, 99% of all auto gas is produced right here in the United States. Um, so there is no import. There's, there's really no reason for it to be down to where you can't get a supply of fuel. Um, next slide. We do on-site on -site fueling facilities. The only cost to the customer uh, to have their own uh, fuel infrastructure, including the tank and uh, the dispenser, uh, the only cost to the customer is to um, connect electrical to it and also um, any landscaping that they want to do. Um, and again, we can uh, integrate that with any fuel management system that you may be operating, or it comes with a, a proprietary in-house fuel management system as well. Uh, next, the simple dispensing. Um, we are the exclusive dealer for the quick connect nozzle. Uh, as you probably remember, it used to be that people, when you were fueling an auto gas car, you had to kind of screw it on, you put on your goggles, your gloves, um, looks like you were going to war. Now there's none of that, it just clicks on. It's um, very safe, it automatically fuels. There's an ODP, which is a automatic cutoff when the tank gets full, the system automatically cuts off. So that's been uh, simplified and the safety of it has been increased, much like our systems under hood, because now what we do is we don't do any drilling. Um, it's all plug and play. Um, so very efficient, um, utilizing the, the latest technology. 
and the safety aspect has gone up tremendously. So I think you're going to skip maybe the next two uh, slides and the next one. There we go. Also, safety. Um, it's low pressure storage, typically between 125 psi in the tank. Uh, the tanks are qu uh, quarter inch carbon steel. Um, they, depending on where they're mounted, can add um, structural integrity to the vehicle. And again, it has an OPD uh, device inside that automatically cuts fuel off uh, when it's full. The next slide will show you, it's really just a reference uh, for customers that we already have uh, in, the, in our system. Um, if, you, if, if you're interested, I can send you a reference sheet. Uh, just give me your information. And the next slide is for Q&A, but we'll hold off on that until uh, the end. Thank you, Sarah, for having us. Yes, thank you, Mike. And uh, for anyone who's interested at the end, we can also send out any of our speakers' contact information. Um, so thank you, Mike. And up thank next, you. we'll hear from Jill. Thank you. Can you all hear me okay? I hear you loud and clear. Great. Well, and thank you all, especially uh, Sarah and John, for hosting us today and having us. Um, I just want to also thank um, the National Biodiesel Board and Maryland Grain Producers. They're the ones that sponsor me to be here today, and I, they're my clients. And it's hard to jam it all in in 10 minutes on each fuel. So keep in mind, this is just an overview presentation and we're happy to go into a deeper dive. And my contact information is at the end. I have a lot of resource slides at the end. So go ahead, Sarah, and advance this slide. Okay, so um, I'm gonna just cover very briefly ethanol and biodiesel, what they are. And the reason I say this, you all probably know, but I'm even amazed that folks at the Department of Transportation don't even know the difference between these fuels. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of background on them, what the status is in Virginia, and then uh, talk a little bit about carbon reductions today versus tomorrow, um, increasing biodiesel and ethanol infrastructure in rural communities, some funding opportunities that you might take advantage of, what's next, and some, again, those resources and contacts at the end. Go ahead. Okay, so what is ethanol? Um, in this case, uh, you know, most people know of it, ethanol is made from corn, but it's also made from sorghum and sugar cane, but new technologies are coming online all the time that are making it from woody, um, woody chips and agricultural residues and industrial gases. I have clients that are making, you know, making biofuels from leftover residue of wood in, in, the, in, you know, in the middle of the woods. So, Keep in mind that this is where we're starting is with corn, but it's not the, the end game for ethanol. And why are we interested in it? Um, primarily, it's, it began as a, a displacement to gasoline um, and then as an alternative oxygen to MTBE when MTBE became a water contaminant. So um, uh, under the renewable fuel standard, I'm not going into those policies today, but that's why we have it in our gasoline today and why it's being expanded. So this also eliminates carcinogens and toxics. It's an octane enhancement. A lot of people want to say that ethanol is bad for the engine, but it actually is a higher performance and it's better for your engine. Um, that's just simple chemistry. And it reduces the formation of ozone, uh, which is, causes smog. So go ahead, next slide. So how is ethanol being used today? Um, there are 21 million flex fuel vehicles out on the road today. That's about 7% of the light duty vehicle market. And these vehicles can run on either gas, regular gasoline, um, which now contains 10% ethanol. So it's 90% gasoline, 10% ethanol. In comparison, there are about 11 million uh, electric vehicles on the road. So we have more than twice that in, in flex fuel vehicles today. Um, and uh, that, that could be using higher blends of fuel. Uh, so we wanna talk, uh, the, the reason they're not is most, mostly infrastructure, but the infrastructure already exists and retailers need to know that, that they can use it and uh, be given some incentives for, for offering it. And we'll get into that in a minute. Um, your retailers can offer E15, which is also known as regular 88. So if you hear the term regular 88, it's 15% ethanol. Um, and it can do this without major changes to existing facilities and any vehicle that is 2001 and newer 
that are approved to use higher ethanol fuels. So that's about 97% of the vehicles on the road today uh, can use E15 of the gasoline, you know, conventional, electric, uh, conventional vehicles on the road today. And E15 is um, a higher octane rating, which typically costs less than gasoline. E15 costs less than regular gasoline. Um, but even though it has this higher performance, usually you sell higher octane fuels at a higher price or premium. Um, so this gives a, a retailer something to, to put at their, the retail road sign to attract customers as well. Okay, go ahead and switch to the next slide. So ethanol and carbon reduction. Uh, politicians, businesses, municipalities are starting to set sustainability goals. I'm sure each of you all have heard discussions about this. The environment is a growing concern and, and carbon targets are, are part of that. Um, I, I liken the electric vehicle to the prom queens, lots of attention focused on it. It's very sexy, but I would liken ethanol or biodiesel to the marching band. Maybe it's because I was in the marching band, but. Um, it, each instrument is indep independently, it does, it's maybe not as significant, but when you put them all together, they have a huge impact. So um, it isn't to say that electric vehicles aren't making a difference, they are, and they have an important role to play. I just don't want you to lose sight of the impact we can have immediately by operating on ethanol and biodiesel in the legacy or existing vehicles today. So we are looking for a model um, for carbon reduction, California is kind of the gold standard, which is why I have that this slide up today. So I want to show it to you if you care about carbon, or if that's an issue for your community or your you as an individual are concerned about it. Um, ethanol in, in this slide is depicted as uh, reducing 40% of the overall carbon in California. The state policy is leading the way in integrating low carbon technologies and biodiesel and renewable diesel amount for the other 41%. So the biofuels are representing 81% of the low carbon fuel standard reductions in California. And, and not that we have a policy like that in Virginia, it just shows you what a state is, you know, when, when the market barriers are, are playing out, what these biofuels are doing in reality. And according to an ethanol um, producer article from July, the, the industry has a near-term goal uh, to reduce their carbon by 50% through carbon capture projects and other initiatives. And the, the fuel neutral or carbon neutral goal for the eth ethanol industry is striving to be carbon neutral just as the electric vehicle industry is. So um, we are planning on, on improving our numbers as, as the years go by. So go ahead and switch to the next slide. Thanks. Um, although we've doubled the number of ethanol stations in the past 10 years, uh, they only represent about 3% of the retail market across the United States. <clears throat> we have a long way to go. And on a positive note, ethanol competes with gasoline on a cost per, bio, cost per mile basis. And, and that said, each retailer markets it independently. And, and so there are always variations. Some are gonna be worse than others. You know, it's the way the retail market works, but, but the fuel pricing slide is, you know, it's a few months old, but you get the idea that ethanol and E15 and E85 prices track gasoline. And you can see that E85, the higher ethanol content fuel is lower in price, but it's also lower in energy content. And that means that it, it basically, you can't go as far on a gallon of ethanol as you can on gasoline. This is well known, but it's, it is what it is, but the, the price reflects that. And so you go basically approximately the same mile per, for the same cost. So it's cost competitive. Go ahead and switch to the next slide. So I, I this isn't the best quality uh, graphic, but you get the idea. This is where the um, ethanol stations are in Virginia. And we have 66 right now. There's 54 public and 12 private. And they're mostly on the corridors. We could do a lot better in our rural communities. So go ahead and, and switch. Um, what this slide is depicting are the, the gal this is um, representative of a project that I worked on with the Virginia Clean Cities to integrate E85 and E15 stations in Maryland through USDA grant. <clears throat> so these are gallons, accumulated gallons of E85 sold under that project on a monthly basis. 
And as you can see, the, each of these different lines that are hard to see is a different station. So as soon as we introduce a station and they're ramped it up and scaled in over a three-year period, they had almost an immediate impact. And this is E85, obviously in 2020. For we, we all know why our volume is down in 2020, but go ahead and switch to the next slide. And these are E15 gallons. Remember, there's a difference. E15 is used in every every conventional um, vehicle, and E85 you need a flexible vehicle to operate it. So these are used differently, um, and so it's it's natural that we're going to see a little more volume from E15 because you can use it in more vehicles. And again, it, as soon as you implement these stations, they're having an immediate impact. Go ahead and go to the next slide. So what are some of the barriers? Um, what makes it so difficult? You know, what do we need to, what barriers do we need to remove? The main one is access to grant funding to upgrade equipment. You know, it's the same for any of these alternate fuels. The good news is USDA's Higher Blend Infrastructure Incentive Program recently completed two rounds, um, one in, in mid-2020 and, and then one earlier this year for a total of $100 million in funding. Um, Ag Appropriations Committee has at, included a billion dollar allocation over eight years to continue this program. And we heard yesterday that the Senate Ag Committee is supportive as, as well. So the likelihood of that funding coming to reality is very high. And with Vilsack as administrator, he, that, that last grant, those last two slides I showed you was funding that Vilsack secured for the, this infrastructure. And the, the fact that he's an administrator now means that the, the likelihood of this funding program is going to continue. And that there'll be, there was in the last two rounds, there were carve outs for fleets and small retailers such as yours. So um, I also wanted to, I, I put up here the USDA Rural Pilot Program. They announced this program earlier this year. We don't know what this is going to look like. There's $10 million just to develop the pilot. So I think that we're going to hear more from, from this rural development pilot program. And so stay in touch. Okay, go ahead and next slide. So um, why do retailers need incentives? Why aren't they doing this themselves? Because it's not that cost, of, you know, it doesn't take that much. Well, most retailers, especially rural retailers, they make about $60,000 a year on their fuel. So they're not making a lot of money. It's hard to recoup those, even those added costs of switching to an, another fuel or, or replacing it. This is a picture of, of a, a pump that has all ethanol E15 and E85 on it, as well as the other three traditional product offerings. It, it costs about $8,000 more, but if you ask a small retailer to, to carve out $8,000 out of less than $60,000, it's gonna to be tough for them. But you can help with public awareness by adding blends to your own county vehicles, maybe asking for hybrid flex fuel vehicles in the future, combining electric and, and ethanol. Um, you know, if enough folks ask for them, the OEMs will offer them. You could also ask for state grants to pay for these upgrades or include biofuels when you're looking at greening options yourself. Okay, next slide. So I'm switching over here to biodiesel and renewable diesel. You know, what are they? Have you heard of these terms? Are you familiar with them? Do you know the difference between biodiesel and renewable diesel? Basically, biodiesel and renewable diesel are made from the same feedstocks, soybean oil, waste veg oil, waste grease, even trees. Um, both can be 100% replacements for petroleum diesel without engine modifications. But it is difficult to compete against other fuels with low carbon fuel standards because they're going to demand this renewable diesel, which for all intents and purposes can be transported in pipelines and looks just like diesel fuel. Renewable diesel is similar to petroleum diesel and it's also produced in the same process or a hydrocracking process, whereas biodiesel is manufactured a little differently through an, a sterification process. I'm not gonna go into the, the details of that, just know that the end products, they look and act like diesel fuel, uh, but they don't have the same particulate matter or greenhouse gases and other toxic emissions the same way. And I'm gonna show you a slide, go ahead. But you can jump through these next two slides pretty quickly. If you look at this, the left and the right, the right is the fossil fuel, the left is renewable diesel. You're not just even visually burning it, you're not seeing those particular emissions. Go ahead and the next slide. There's another one the same. Go ahead and the next slide. So I uh, want to talk a little bit about um, how it's being sold. Most, you know, in Virginia, 
we can't get renewable diesel because California is demanding it all or Oregon and Washington that have these low carbon fuel standards. So we have to look more towards biodiesel. Um, <clears throat> and uh, we do have some biodiesel producers in Virginia. I'll talk about that in a minute, but I wanna focus for a moment on um, you know, uses of B20, um, all the engine manufacturers, I, I think, if there are any, I'm not even aware of what ones don't allow B20 anymore. I think they've all blessed it. But using B100 um, has had the stigma of if you have some cold weather issues, you won't be able to start in the winter. So there's this company called that, uh, Optus Technologies that developed this vector system that has a heated tank and fuel line that eliminate this cold weather issue. And they, the systems cost between $13,000 and $16,000 for this refuse hauler. But new applications, if they haven't developed, it might cost as much as $20,000 per heavy duty vehicle. Um, it, it's, it's not as much as adding, you know, it's not doubling the price of the equipment, but it, it is something. REG it, um, worked with, I, I'm showing this picture is DC DPW and DC Water are integrating over hundred of these vehicles in their fleet because they've been so happy with this program. And they, um, uh, REG, the Renewable Energy Group, um, put in their refueling infrastructure for them. They also got some funding from the HBIT program I mentioned a minute ago. And they're looking for others to partner to do the same program. If you're interested, let me know. Okay, next slide. And there's also home heating oil as well. Um, so most folks are looking at the biofuels as a way to reduce carbon, um, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And certainly biodiesel does that, renewable diesel. Um, the, it's, the industry is estimating that it's about 86% on the life cycle emissions. That means from when those crops are grown to when they're burned in the engine, full life cycle. And it also lowers other particulates and hydrocarbons as, as noted in this slide. Um, and for every unit of energy, this has been a topic in the past about biofuels, for every unit of energy you put in to produce it, you get 3.5 units of energy back. And keep in mind, any fuel requires energy to make it. So another issue has been um, an issue for our industry has been, uh, oh, we're gonna take up all the land to grow energy crops and we won't have enough land for our fuel or for our food, which is just, it's a myth out, that's out there. And I will show you why in just a second, but soybeans aren't grown for their, pro, they aren't grown for their oil, they're grown for their protein to feed the world, to feed animals that, that we want to eat. So um, the value isn't in the oil, although that's becoming more valuable, it's in the protein. All right, go, go ahead and, and go on to the next slide. So I put this up there because you're in rural communities, you're probably aware of this, that, that um, you know, over the years and over the centuries, really, the acreage we need to grow land, uh, to grow our crops is, is smaller and smaller every year. It's because we are more efficient as farmers at producing per acre. And this has been historically true for past couple of centuries. So even though we have this renewable fuel standard in the books, we're still lowering uh, the amount of acreage we have out there um, in farmland because we, uh, for that very reason that we're more efficient. So when people say that we're taking up more land to grow our energy crops, it's just false. Go ahead. So I did want to, and I apologize, I didn't update this slide, but this, um, these are a couple of your suppliers in Virginia, but I also went and looked at, um, some additional information. And I found that there are about um, 20 different vendors, uh, 19 to 20 different vendors in Virginia that are supplying biodiesel. I'm just going to mention a few here. Quarles has about a half dozen public refueling stations. Um, uh, Loves has about a half dozen as well, and they're expanding. We also have James Rimmer Petroleum, Papco, Northern Neck uh, Oil Company, Culpepper Petroleum, Foster's, and then we have some uh, Finwood and then a few others um, that are offering um, biodiesel at their facility. Quantico, Smithsonian are, are two examples as well. And um, I also wanted to mention Rico and Synergy are two biodiesel producers that are um, here in Virginia. And we'd love to see them expand. They're, you know, we import all of our energy into, you know, for transportation into the state. Rico and Synergy are producing it here in the state. I'd love to see us do more to produce fuels in our own, in our own area. Go ahead.
So why do we not need biofuels? This is kind of a summary slide here, but um, biofuels lower carbon emissions in vehicles today through 2020, through 2050 and beyond. Um, Fuels Institute indicates biofuels will remain a low cost pathway to lowering carbon in transportation, um, providing energy and environmental justice. These are hot topics, uh, environmental justice, and especially in rural communities, they're cost effective and is because they're cost effective. Low carbon fuel standard policies are showing biofuels are out competing other technologies and achieving um, CO2 reductions. And then I also wanted to point out that MIT and Fuels Institute, two independent organizations predicted EVs will be will only be about 40% of the on road light duty vehicles by 2050, which is still an amazing accomplishment and it will require a lot of initiative to get us there. So, and which kudos to them, I think that's fabulous, but what will the other 60% be? And how are we going to integrate towards these other um, non-fossil fuel energies? Go ahead. So I'm gonna bounce through these slides pretty quickly. This slide is just showing how carbon accumulates, that it's not just a one and done, it's, it's actually has a lingering effect. If we reduce carbon today, it's gonna to actually have an impact in the years to get ahead. So go ahead and show. These are if you had uh, introduced and run a vehicle on carbon and it can, uh, per ton, if we continue to reduce it, how will it grow? Go ahead. Keep going. And, and that again is just to show you what the annual year on year uh, tonnage of reducing one ton of carbon will do. So go ahead and the next slide. My point about that is really that we're trying to, the biofuels industry believes they, they have a role to play in reducing carbon today with those existing technologies. But this slide is a, a rural development um, slide, USDA rural development. They provide a lot of grants for a variety of things. So I'm gonna focus you on the, the inner two columns here. Um, preparedness for infrastructure and equipment and preparedness for small businesses and entrepreneurs. Go ahead to go to the next slide. And you can Google this too, but I have the link at, at home or at the end here. Um, okay, so, oops, I apologize. Did I just move that? Can you go back to the next one? Sorry about that. Okay. Um, Rural Business Development Grants, or RBDG, provides $10,000 to $500,000 to benefit small and emerging businesses in rural areas. So if you want to encourage your local businesses, you can do it through training and technical assistance through this program. Um, you can also renovate buildings, equipment, machinery, such as a refueling facility. Um, you can also use it for rural business incubator programs and economic development, such as a feasibility study, for example, to look at this. Um, there's also the Rural Innovation Stronger Economy Grant, the RISE grant, provides a half million dollars to two million dollars for a four-year grant for public bodies or nonprofits to accelerate partnerships to deliver economic job training with the intent to create high-wage jobs and form rural businesses, again could be a biofuel business. Your retailers or businesses uh, can use the BNI um, or the REAP, REAP program as well uh, for uh, business industry loan guarantees or small businesses to finance retail projects or fleet upgrades. Okay, go ahead to the next slide. How am I doing on time, Sarah? Am I still okay? Okay, good. Mama's done here. So this one is a slide is again, it's both USDA rural, USDA rural development and small business administration. If you guys aren't familiar with these, I just wanted to pop this up. I'm not going to go over this detailed slide, but you get to see the difference that you can, you know, for projects up to $25 million, you're going to look at a BNI loan guarantee or loan program or a REAP if you're going to upgrade efficiencies or add um, uh, a biofuel business in your area, you could look at a REAP grant or REAP loan. They do have grants up to a half million dollars. Or you, if, if you're looking at a smaller project, you could look at SBA. I've used a lot, had a lot of retailers use the SBA program to, to upgrade their facilities that pays for up to 90% of, in some cases, even 95% of the project loan. So there are ways to get financing if you need it. Okay, next slide. Um, again, I'm not going to go over this. This is just a comparative slide on what it does cover and what it doesn't cover for these different programs. 
I didn't go over the red leg program. Uh, the, the counties might be interested to know that the red leg program um, you know, provides rural electric funding um, that they can low out at, they can reloan out at low or no interest for economic development programs, uh, such as a business incubator program, business expansion training and whatnot. I've already kind of talked about the other ones, but um, the biorefineries, if you want to add, a, if you have somebody who wants to do a biorefinery, such as the, I will tell you, we, uh, the, the Synergy plant used the REAP grant. They could have used the biorefinery loan guarantee program too. So these are being used in our area. Go ahead and next slide. Okay, so start where you are, use what you have, and know what you uh, do what you can. So that's my challenge to you all. You've got a lot of vehicles out there that could be using biofuels today. I hope you will think about encouraging higher blends, either E15 or, or E85 at those existing facilities or in your own operations. Go ahead, the next slide. Here's the contact information for SBA, USDA, and here's my contact information as well. Please reach out to me if you have additional questions about any of these programs or about ethanol or biodiesel. Go ahead. And these next slides you can bounce through. I'm not gonna go over them. They're just the links on the projects that I talked about today. And that's it for me, thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you so much, Jill. That was a bunch of really great information. And like I said, we will share contact information at the end and I can also share um, these links that Jill has provided um, when we share the recording and resources at the end. So thank you. All right. And up next, we will hear from Sherry Merrill from NGV America. Sherry, you can go ahead and take it away. Thank you, Sarah. And thank you for uh, the ability to speak with you all today about achieving net zero now through using natural gas vehicles um, in all of America, but in rural America as our conversation is today. Next slide, please. Uh, NGV America, or Natural Gas Vehicles for America, is the National Trade Association dedicating to increasing the marketplace for uh, natural gas vehicles. And this is both traditional natural gas and renewable natural gas. Uh, we have 200 plus members. Next slide. And uh, many of these are names that you'll recognize. I'll point out a few uh, names such as UPS Waste Management, um, Frito-Lay of big fleets been using this a long time. Uh, one of our newer members is Amazon. They've decided to use class six through eight. So heavy duty trucking will be renewable natural gas uh, trucks. And we're very excited about this. They, they just believe that this is the only viable alternative fuel today. Uh, down the road, they'll see where it goes. But uh, for day, today they've bought, um, but probably about a thousand trucks and they're moving on to three to 5,000 more. So uh, next slide. So natural gas vehicles achieving the drive clean rural USA project goals. We typically talk about um, our fuel as being sustainable, cost effective, available and domestic. When you couple that with the goals of the drive clean rural USA project, on the sustainable side, we're reducing emissions significantly more than other fuels. We're providing a renewable path. On the cost effective, we are cost effective. Virtually similar costs. There's an upfront increase in cost for the vehicle, but there is no after treatment, no, none of the filters needed that go into diesel um, and the operation beyond uh, the purchase is cheaper. Uh, provide, provides new business opportunities and jobs, and that's especially in the renewable natural gas arena. Um, also solves the problem of what to do with waste. Available now, so we have vehicles of all types. We have stations, both fast fill, which is the same uh, experience as gasoline or diesel, and time fill, which allows, uh, and trash trucks use this a lot, but our buses to fuel overnight. And then we're a domestic energy source giving us energy independence. Next slide. So we talk about sustainability, we talk about cleaner than 90% uh, cleaner, frankly. Um, when we look at the Cummins Westport Ultra Low Nox engine, the certification for this engine is to 0.02 grams per brake horsepower hour standard. So this is 
a NOx standard, a, a tailpipe standard, but it's 90% cleaner than the EPA current standard, which is 0 0.2 and 90% cleaner than the latest available diesel engine. So we are 90% cleaner at the tailpipe uh, than these engines. And this is in medium and heavy duty spaces. Next slide. Did some cost comparisons. And if we take a look at how much it costs to reduce a pound of NOx over the lifetime of the vehicle, uh, natural gas in the turquoise, and you can see the heavy duty truck, a uh, trash truck, a transit bus and a school bus. And each of these is significantly less than diesel or electric. Electric, you can't get in the heavy duty truck, um, but if you could, it's estimated based on the uh, EV numbers to be about $51 to reduce a ton of NOx, but it's 58 if you use diesel. You go to a waste management type of refuse truck or a, a refuse truck, and it's $69 for natural gas, 496 for diesel and 151 for electric. And I won't read the rest of these, but um, they're even more uh, interesting as you go down the list there. Next slide. And then if we look at our well to wheels, greenhouse gases, uh, traditional liquefied natural gas will give us an 11% reduction and uh, compressed natural gas is 17% reduction. And I emphasize traditional. Next slide. So what about renewable natural gas? And what we're hearing now, and I'm seeing this in Colorado, is a broader concept called recoverable methane. So that can be a variety of, of sources of methane, could be leaks in the oil and gas process, capturing that methane, uh, coal bed methane, that type of thing. But talking about renewable natural gas, on the left side, you've got four sources, livestock waste, forest and crop waste, wastewater, food waste, all going into an anaerob anaerobic digester, then going in, becoming biogas, RNG, biomethane, which goes into fuels uh, for trucks, and frankly, anything that can take natural gas as a fuel. Uh, also, the byproduct uh, is digestate, which can be fertilizer, soil amendments, livestock bedding, et cetera. And landfill waste goes in directly with, to the system without being uh, needing to go through the anaerobic digester. Next slide. So that all sounds great, but is there enough? Um, who's using it? Where are we at today? So NGV America, coupled with the Coalition for RNG, did a survey and found that the 2020 NGV fuel use across the US for any natural gas vehicle using fuel, 53% were using renewable natural gas already. If you go to California, it's 92% using renewable natural gas in 2020. The chart on the right, something you could look at later, uh, shows the growth in renewable natural gas source. And we are seeing, uh, each state take this on as um, a huge opportunity to grow a new econ uh, economy line for them as they take care of a waste problem and, and produce natural gas with it. Next slide. Just to do a little bit of perspective on EV fleet requirements for power, if we're looking at the power it takes to run um, the Empire State Building at its peak time, it's nine megawatts. If we look at what it takes to run 50 large trucks, and these are EV trucks, it would be nine megawatts. So we're looking at a similar amount of electricity being used for 50 trucks as it takes to power the Empire State Building at its peak. If you multiply that out, to the 2 million class eight trucks that are out there today in the country, or the 10 to 12 million heavy duty trucks that are in the US today, we don't currently have enough power um, on our grid available to do that, nor do we have um, enough in the pipeline as far as getting more power generated, especially renewable power. So we're really looking at a problem that will take decades to fix, and we need solutions that work now. Next slide. 
So affordable, scalable, and ready right now. Next slide. This slide is from the California Air Resources Board, and I enjoy showing this slide because, um, as we're all well aware, California is leading the country in their drive to a full uh, electric environment in California. However, if you really look at carbon reduction, and this is their chart, their data, uh, the most carbon reduction comes from renewable natural gas used in a CNG vehicle. That's the yellow horizontal line. The next most is the light purple line above it, and that's renewable natural gas, liquefied natural gas. Then you can look at the dark purple, that's electricity. The green is hydrogen. And then there are other fuels in there. And this is what they use in their carb low carbon fuel standard um, to measure carbon intensities. So we really have a product ready today that is the least carbon, will reduce the most carbon for the cost. Next slide. The other thing that we have is vehicles that are available today in every medium and heavy duty and high horsepower application. So it isn't just the pickup truck and a lot of passenger vehicles, which are important to convert. Um, it's really where the highest emissions are coming from in your, your heavy duty trucks, your of all sorts, including dump trucks, trash trucks, you name it. Um, then your ships and locomotives and that type of thing. Next, your transit buses. And lastly, uh, school buses. Converting school buses is a nice idea, but it's really not going to reduce that much um, carbon or emissions in general. So with natural gas, you're looking at a diesel gasoline equivalent range, power, cost, and fueling time with significantly greater emissions reductions, both tailpipe and life cycle. Next slide. We have stations. We have 1,568 stations across the country, and that's CNG. We have 114 liquefied natural gas, and that's just the on-road stations. So we have stations and more are being put up every day. We also have the time fill capability where you can, uh, fuel maker, if some of you have been around a while, is back. So we have a home fueling capability that is back again that can be in your garage. Next slide. So who's in? I mentioned a few already, but just to reiterate, Amazon, Frito-Lay, Waste Management, Anheuser-Busch, UPS, and many, many more. In the middle, I wanted to point out one of the newest technologies that you can order next year. It's in its final testing and is in quite a few fleets today. And we're starting to use this vehicle in shows and, and the excitement at the ACT Expo was amazing. This is a hybrid electric vehicle class A tractor, but the hybrid part comes from compressed natural gas on board. And you're not running the gas in the engine, you're running the gas to produce electricity to put in the battery to run the engine. So this is a truck that can take you as the mileage you need to go, but then you can switch to electricity when you're in the industrialized areas, the ports, the areas, the communities of interest uh, uh, that historically have been having the most emissions. You can run on the electric there and have no emissions. When you're running the natural gas engine, you have that 90% reduction or virtually near zero emissions. Next slide. So what does this really mean? Natural gas vehicles and renewable gas, natural gas offer the cleanest commercially available path, potentially carbon negative as we've seen, to reduce heavy duty vehicle emissions now and for years to come. Next slide. Uh, come see more, hear more about our industry and the opportunities October 18th through 21st in Phoenix. The uh, NGV America Annual Summit will take place. Next slide. This is my contact information. And uh, Sarah, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you, Sherry. That was a great presentation. Um, and then up next, we will hear from Devin Slater from Dominion Energy. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you all for attending today. Uh, my name is Devin Slaughter and I work on Dominion Energy's electrification team. 
I work on a number of the programs and offerings I'm going to outline for you, along with focusing on general EV education and staying up to date on the ever-changing electric vehicle landscape. So Sarah, you can go ahead and go to the next slide. So first, what you've very likely seen in the news, uh, Dominion Energy School Bus Program. Why school buses? Well, kids for one, you know, that's definitely a really great area where we want to electrify. We want to get children away from the emissions of school buses. Um, you know, there, we've all probably gone to um, a school where there are a lot of buses sitting in a parking lot idling, uh, you know, so it's definitely a really, it was a good low hanging fruit as far as emissions go. So Dominion Energy has successfully rolled out 50 school buses and 36 school bus chargers to 15 school districts in Virginia. Now the DEQ has also allocated $9.2 million to electric, uh, uh, for electric school buses in Virginia from the Volkswagen settlement money. Uh, Dominion Energy is also working on that. They're working on helping install, own, maintain necessary DC fast charging infrastructure to support the buses purchased through this program for the qualifying schools. When the buses are not being used for people transportation, they will be used to inject stored energy back on the grid to support renewables like wind and solar. This also allows schools, especially I know um, in rural, more rural counties, this allows schools to be safe spaces during bad storms. Um, Already it's a good place to go with, you know, a lot of them have brick walls, they're very safe, but now we have the added benefit of the vehicle to grid technology where a school bus can potentially keep the power gone in a school. And you can go ahead to the next slide. Another roadblock that we noticed with EV adopt or electric vehicle adoption was some people don't own their own home. Some people live in an apartment, whether it's they live in the city and they want to stay there, or you know they live in a more um, suburban area. They love living in an apartment. You know, there's a lot of different reasons why someone might not own their own home. We wanted to open up the door for people to be able to have electric vehicles um, and have solid level two charging without needing to own their own home. So we kicked off the smart charging infrastructure pilot, affectionately called SKIP, SKIP the emissions, and last year, and we've actually already filled the multifamily and workplace charging segments for applications. Um, so what multifamily housing charging helps those who might live in an apartment complex or a townhome or, you know, even sometimes neighborhoods where homes are close together or don't have garages and, you know, people don't want to install those charging stations. Uh, these rebates are available for the charging to be put in. Then same thing with workplace charging. If you have charging at your workplace, chances are your electric vehicle will get charged enough to take you to and from work and also run your errands. So not all these applications have been approved. So we still influence or uh, we still welcome applications for these categories. And by not approved, essentially there's just a process for making sure that the infrastructure is what it needs to be. We have um, an itemized list of the infrastructure that was installed, that sort of thing. It's all explained on our uh, website when you apply for the program. So we are hoping to have a wait list in place uh, for people who still want this multifamily housing and workplace charging. And maybe in the future, we'd love to expand the program to help include those folks. So if you are interested in seeing if your organization qualifies for any of the four branches of this program, please visit dom.com slash SCIP. And you can go ahead to the next slide. So another uh, piece of the puzzle for EV adoption is an off-peak plan or a time of use rate. We recently kicked off this time of use rate available to the first 10,000 customers who sign up. The rate charges lower rates per kilowatt hour during off-peak electricity usage. While this is uh, beneficial for all folks who are able to be flexible with their electricity usage, such as when they run their washer dryer, when they uh, run their dishwasher, that sort of thing, this plan is ideal for EV drivers because they can schedule their EVs to charge during those off-peak hours and save even more money. Eligibility is simple. You must have a smart meter, be an existing residential customer, and not be enrolled in another demand response program. All you need to do is go online and log into your account, and it will tell you if you are eligible for this program. So as you can see by this chart here on the slide, 12 a.m. to 5 a.m. is um, a super off-peak time. That is when your kilowatt hour charge is going to be the absolute lowest. 
Most people are asleep from 12 a.m. to 5 a.m. That's a great time to charge your electric vehicle. So if you'll go ahead to the next slide. An effort that I'm probably personally most excited about is Dominion Energy's Green Fleet announcement. Folks from our innovation, electrification, facilities, fleet, sustainability, and other teams work together to develop ideas for a roadmap towards greening Dominion's internal fleet. This included year-by-year -year action items to get our goal responsibility, to hit our goal responsibly and strategically. So essentially, we all sat down in a, well, virtually sat down in a room and brainstormed what needs to be done. You know, we had different people from different parts of the organization, which was extremely helpful in deciding what was actually realistic and what wasn't. So we um, went all the way out to 2030 with different plans of ways that we could green our fleet, whether that was charging infrastructure, working with charging logistics, you know, um, say Tom comes in with his, he's overnight and he comes in at 8 p.m., you know, making sure he has a vehicle that's charged. And then when Nancy comes in at 6 a.m., making sure there's a vehicle for her ready to use, you know, logistics around that, um, tying it into our goals, a lot of different things that we could do to help uh, influence this announcement. So our goal is and I say goal, and I really don't almost don't like that word because we're going to hit it. You know, we were really motivated for this. It's not just a goal. It's, it's ingrained in our culture here. Um, so 75 percent of passenger vehicles, including sedans and SUVs, will be converted to electric power by 2030. And 50 percent of work vehicles, that's forklifts, ATVs, um, full size pickup trucks, bucket trucks, that sort of thing, will be converted to by 2030 to an alternative fuel. Um, and we are already using trucks equipped with electric PTO systems. So even before we started this initiative, we were on the right track. Then after 2030, all new vehicles from sedans to heavy duty vehicles will be electric or powered by alternative fuels. Pending availability of products. I know I'm sure we've all heard about the blue chip shortage and um, all kinds of supply chains are a little wonky right now. So hopefully, um, you know, in the next couple of years, that'll start to even out and manufacturers will meet their promises on the electric vehicles that they'll have available. Um, so you can go ahead to the next slide. So Dominion Energy also realizes that electrification does not exist in a vacuum. Um, adoption education lies just outside of just how to charge, where to charge, and the logistics of owning the vehicle. Um, there are factors that need to be considered, and public safety is arguably one of the most important ones. We are starting the effort to responsibly encourage EV adoption by hosting a training for first responders. Electric car fires behave differently than gasoline or diesel car fires, and first responders need to be prepared for that. They also need to be able to recognize what is an EV and what isn't. For example, the Chevy Cruze looks a lot like the Chevy Bolt. Um, and our details on this are limited as far as the actual training, uh, but we are working with Goochland County Fire Rescue and the Virginia Department of Fire Programs to get some training set up for area firefighters. You can go ahead to the next slide. I'm sure everyone on this call is really excited that we're starting to get back to in-person events. Uh, if you don't already know, next week is National Drive Electric Week. Dominion Energy will be kicking off celebrations this Saturday at the Electric Car Palooza in Chester at the Perkinson Center for the Arts. There will be several activities for people of all ages, and we will have our Dominion Energy EV experts in attendance. I believe we are also bringing a vehicle uh, from our own fleet. Um, then we are also hosting a ride and drive event later this fall. Personally, with, I don't drive an electric vehicle, but... Um, I've dealt with a lot of people who don't and never have. And, you know, one of the most exciting things is when someone gets behind the wheel of an EV for the first time and they realize that for one, it's really not the, the space age technology that we seem to think it is. And these vehicles have so much power. Um, it's almost counterintuitive and um, it's a, you know, it's a great experience. So we are hosting a ride and drive on November 20th, which will be open to customers. You'll be able to drive a variety of electric vehicles. We'll have Teslas, we'll have Hyundai Kona, we'll have Chevy Bolt, hopefully. Um, so, you know, so there'll be a plethora of vehicles you can try. Um, so keep an eye on Dominion Energy social media for more information on that and to learn how to sign up. And then you can go to the last slide. 
So please feel free to email us for more information. Um, we've got a robust team with a lot of different knowledge. We all come from very different places. So it really gives us a good, um, well-rounded foundation of knowledge. So if you just email electrification at Dominion Energy, um, one of these people on our team, and our team is also expanding, which is exciting, uh, but we'll be able to get back to you and respond to your question appropriately. And that is everything that I have on Dominion Energy's programs. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Devin. It's great to hear that Dominion is uh, talking the talk, but also walking the walk, moving their own fleet over to electricity. So thank you for that. And with that, we will now move into the question and answer period. Um, so anyone who has questions, you can go ahead and feel free to unmute yourself to ask them, or you can drop them in the chat and I will work through the ones on the chat. Um, so um, I will first start off with one of the ones in the chat. Um, we have one place said, would there be air emission and reduced greenhouse gas benefits to rural Virginia for low carbon fuel standards? Anyone on the panel can feel free to answer that if they have any knowledge. Sure, I can, I can answer that, certainly. Anytime you're gonna have a low carbon fuel standard, pop, it's gonna affect everybody, you know, uh, air travels. And while, while you're gonna have uh, implemented, I assume, it, well, it says local, right? Were you talking about local or statewide? Not sure, is that Alan's question? Anyway. Yeah, that is Alan's question. Anyway, the upshot is if we had a low, low carbon fuel standard, it's here it would be implemented throughout the region and impact all of us. Excellent. I had put something in the chat that um, Weld County in Colorado has been using natural gas vehicles for all of their heavy duty applications. And frankly, um, their vehicles driving around for years and it's just saved them quite a bit of money. Um, the city of Longmont, Colorado, is um, a lot of cities have done this. And this is a, I wouldn't call them rural, but they're not cities in the sense of Denver. Uh, but they took and their wastewater and created renewable natural gas and they're now running their trash trucks on the renewable get natural gas. So it is uh, ultimately saving them a lot of money. Thank you, Sherry. And now, um, does anyone have any questions that they wanna ask before I jump back into chat questions? I will take the silence as a no. Um, so the, the next question we have is, are there any notable community success stories that you stand out to you where implementation, growth of alternative fuel vehicles, EV technology in rural areas has been a, um, has really made an impact um, for any of the speakers here? Not, not a, nothing comes to mind specifically, but that doesn't mean with with biodiesel and ethanol, you can implement them in any town or or city. It, it, but certainly, we know that biofuels are having a huge impact on rural rural jobs and and rural economies. That's across the kind of across the board. <laughs> Uh, I will, and then let me give you one example on that. I, I, you know, one of my clients is a Maryland grain producers and even though none of their corn goes to ethanol, they, they advocate and support ethanol development in this region because they know that the value of their corn is, is more valuable because of the greater use of um, corn going to ethanol or having a, 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 its market is in the ethanol space. If that market were to go away, their, their value of their corn would go away as well. So even though it's, you know, it, it touches all of us in that respect, rural communities. Definitely, and I think that's a great example because through this project, we're here to support um, transportation on alternative fuels, but we're also here to support the communities that are fueling that transportation as well. So it's a great example. Thank you, Bill. I, I will say one other thing too, is that with the um, down in Pennington Gap has been known for being a really big uh, coal town, but it, it has a biodiesel producer down there and that they were able to take advantage of some of the state grants for green jobs. Um, and so they are now employing more people and using local resources. And so I'd love to see more of that happen here in Virginia. Some other examples would be the dairy farms. Um, so we have a dairy farm in very rural part of New Mexico 
who has put in an anaerobic digester and is capturing from the manure the methane. And then they're, uh, they're actually putting the gas into pipelines. In Indiana, we have an application where uh, they're putting the gas into compressed natural gas and a station right on site. So it's a public access station. They're using it to run their milk trucks. Um, and it's it's saving money in, in a variety of ways, as well as creating a, a economic opportunity. Sarah, I would just go back and um, I think we have several successful programs there in the state of Virginia that are going on right now. Um, new customers coming on, uh, new jurisdictions uh, going to the technology. Uh, but with the city of Petersburg, I think um, if, if anybody has an opportunity to attend that event, you'll see exactly what can be done. Um, they have um, faced some challenges within the last 10, 10 years. I think that going to this is really going to uh, maybe turn that situation around. And it's mainly they're doing it for, for the same three reasons. Uh, number one being uh, the cost and saving money. Um, you know, based on the state contract, a jurisdiction, most jurisdictions can buy this technology at $5,400 for a vehicle. Um, and the infrastructure comes in at no charge. So it's actually, you know, absolutely a win-win for them. And they don't have to do anything special with it. It's a biofuel system, still runs on gasoline. Some of the agencies, like the police department, say use it for that reason to extend their range. Uh, so they're not having to come off the road to go to fuel. So, um, yeah, I think that there's a lot of success that can be had by different jurisdictions, municipalities, uh, by utilizing this. And the cost is, um, is not anything that's going to prohibit them from being able to do it. Excellent, thank you. And yeah, we're very excited to see renewable propane into Virginia. And for anyone who is interested in attending that event, um, that will be on the 23rd. And uh, my colleague Bruce posted a link to the registration, which will give you all of the information if you're interested in attending. Um, so check out the chat for that. And Jill also just posted a resource in the chat for biodiesel success stories that you can check out. And Jill, I don't know if you wanted to say anything more about that. Oh, only, you know, you were asking for examples. So um, there are a bunch of examples of success stories using biodiesel at the MBB website, and they can do it a better job of it than I can. <laughs> so I just put the link in there for you. Awesome, thank you. And I will include that link in our email out to all the registrants as well. Thank you very much. Awesome. Well, does anyone have any other questions while we are here? I do have something to throw out that I forgot to mention that there are some funding opportunities as well. Um, besides the rural ones, I did mention um, uh, there is some EPA environmental justice grants out, out there and, and Sarah, I can get those links to you. Um, and then there are also some DERA and CMAT grants too that could potentially be used at, at the rural level. But uh, Alan would know more about where those dollars are going in Virginia than I would, but I just throw them out as potential vehicle opportunities to buy down the cost of vehicles. Yeah, that would be great. Any funding opportunities that we can have to sift through for these counties is, is an excellent resource. Yeah. Well, awesome. Um, if anyone else has a question, go ahead and feel free to shout it out. Otherwise, I will put up the contact information for us at Virginia Clean Cities um, and Transportation Energy Partners, the nonprofit that's heading this whole project. Um, and so I just want to say a big thank you to all of our great speakers who are here today and all of the counties and fleets that have joined us. We really appreciate your time and your interest. Um, here's our contact information. As I said, if anyone on this call has any questions about alternative fuels or interested in participating in this project that will provide free alternative fuel technical support, please feel free to reach out to myself or John with Virginia Clean Cities and we can get you connected with whoever you need and whatever, whatever funding opportunities you may be interested in. Um, also, if you submitted specific questions on your registration about specific projects that you are interested in, I just wanted to let you know that um, we at VCC will be reaching out to you directly so we can get an idea of what projects you're looking into and what opportunities will serve your fleet or counties the best. Um, 
So again, thank you everyone. I greatly appreciate your time. And I think we can give everyone back about 15 minutes of their afternoon.